Uh, welcome to the CEO uh, Breakfast and Strategy Series, co-hosted by the Schneider School of Business Economics at St. Norbert College. I am Brian Brees, the president of the college. It's my great delight to welcome you here, to have all of you here uh, for this program this morning. Now in the 21st year, the CEO Series provides uh, exec area executives with the opportunity to hear from some of our top CEOs, and today will be no different. Uh, this resource is brought to you through the generosity of our sponsors, including our presenting sponsor, WPS Health Solutions, title sponsors, Myron Construction, Johnson Bank, Johnson Insurance, and Insight Publications, and the sponsor for this session, Kirthau Attorneys. Davis Kirthau Attorneys. Let's give them a round of applause. At your table are some folders with information. I encourage you to take, uh, take those with you and take a, a closer look at our sponsors. Most of these sponsors you know pretty well uh, because they're such steady supporters. But please uh, take a look at those materials. And uh, to get uh, this morning started in appropriate fashion, I'd like to invite us all uh, to say a common prayer. And if I might invite you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And together we say, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, bon appetit. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Scott Tierling. Scott has served as president of Warner Electric since 2013, providing leadership, in-depth strategic thinking, and the execution skills to lead the company and its related entities. Prior to his employment with Werner, he was at Rockwell Automation, where he served in various leadership roles for 20 years. Mr. Tierling graduated with a Bachelor of Electrical Engineering degree from University of Wisconsin-Madison and earned his MBA from the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, I've had the real pr pleasure of getting to know Scott through the New North uh, Board of Directors and since I've met him, it seems like everywhere I go, I, I find Scott engaged in the community in, in some important way. And so it's uh, my great privilege to uh, introduce to you Scott Tierling. Scott? Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Let's talk about, uh, if we can, disruption. Uh, show of hands here, who in this audience has spoken about disruption in your business, in your place of work in the past, say, 30 days? Show of hands. Get them up high, please up high, all right? I would, I would venture uh, uh, a statement as, as follows. I think that disruption is, is here, it's here to stay, and I think it's accelerating. We're gonna see more and more of this as time marches on. So it's incumbent upon all of us as business leaders to understand disruption, understand what's happening around us, and in some cases to us, and take the plans to mitigate the risk and seize the opportunity. And that's what Werner's doing around disruption. And I want to share with you a few comments and ideas about how we're doing that within our company that I hope you find applicable and, and interesting for your businesses as well. So disruption, just to ground the group for a starting point here, we've talked about disruption. You raise your hands. It's not exactly uh, an uncommon word nowadays. You've discussed disruption that's happening on a national basis. Just to ground the entire group, let's just start off with disruption on a national basis. I think the poster child for disruption has got to be the home video industry, fair? So we start off with Blockbuster, right? We'd all go rent movies in the old days, we'd go to the store, we'd park the car, we'd rent the movie, we'd watch it, we'd turn it in two days later, pay the late charge that we owed, and we were happy, right? <laughs> that was great for a long time, until what? Until Redbox came along and said, wait a minute, we can do this and offer you more convenience. Don't make a trip to the store for, for the movie, to Blockbuster. You're at the grocery store, you're at Walgreens, get your movie there. And oh, by the way, speak of convenience, turn into wherever you want to after you're done watching it. Turning in at the other store when you're across town the following day. It was about convenience. They disrupted Blockbuster, right? Well, we weren't done with that. Along comes Netflix. Now there's no, button, there's no store whatsoever, there's no kiosk whatsoever. You watch it from home, right? These guys are still good at, dis at disruption they're disrupting themselves because as the market's caught up to Netflix, Hulu and others, what are they doing now? It's no longer a business model about sharing videos and movies, they're creating their own content. They're so good at dis disruption, they're creating a whole new space for themselves. 
That's, a, that's the, in my thinking, that's the poster child for disruption, right? But there's more, right? Tax industry, obviously, obviously high fixed costs. Uh, municipality regulates the taxi licenses in New York City, Los Angeles, right? Michael Porter in his Five Forces model would say that the taxi industry is a pretty safe industry. You know, that the barriers to entry, the threat of substitution is pretty low. A good place to be. Well, that was true, Michael Porter, until recently with Uber, right? <coughs> How about the hotel industry? Look at the Hilton Hotel locations around the world. Pretty impressive footprint for hotels all over the world. Um, in 95 years, they've built a, 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 a capacity, almost 700,000 hotel rooms in more than 90 countries and 24 billion in revenue. 95 years, 24 billion in revenue. Along comes Airbnb in six years. More rooms, twice the countries, half the revenue, but the model's different. There's disruption, right? What I find staggering here is, the, is 95 years for Hilton, six years for Airbnb, and they're just getting started. Where will it be in five more years? That's disruption. And the speed of change I find staggering. I also find staggering the fact Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no taxis. Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Netflix owns no cinemas. These companies, this disruption is changing how we do business. This disruption is happening on a national basis. Is it happening here in the Fox Valley? Well, sure it is, right? Here's a study that came out recently from St. Norbert and the New North, all right? The Business Intelligence Committee study. In this study, by the way, by the way, um, it, um, in this study, we'll talk about what's happening locally, we'll happen, what's, what's happening to us, our businesses locally. Before we do that, though, disruption. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself here a little bit. Uh, disruption. I, I challenge you to think about disruption uh, in the fact that it's not going away. I challenge you to see it differently. Don't see disruption as a negative, as, 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 as a risk. It can be a risk if we don't address it, but instead see disruption differently. See it as the upside from disruption and frankly, the opportunity that comes from it behind. I think if we play our cards right as business leaders, we can use disruption to our advantage, right? I think that's what we're here to go do, is it not? That's our role as business leaders, all of us individually, right? So, is it happening locally? You bet it is, you bet it is. Here's a study from St. Norbert University. This is, uh, this is the, uh, the scan of the inside page of the study. Here it is, and what the study says is that in our area, in our community, let's just talk locally now, not nationally. In our community, disruptions occurring, what's happening? The amount of the workforce with skills and experience available for our business. Dave Gross talking this morning at, at breakfast about the need to find talent for jobs outside of Wisconsin. It's a challenge, right, Dave? It's very, very difficult. So skilled workers is a challenge, it's a, it's a disruption. Companies entering your, your market with new business models. Do you see new competition yet in your space? If not, you will, it's coming. How about the mix of generations in the workforce? I think, looking out in the audience, I can say this safely, the, the, come of the, the, the rise of the millennials, right? It's happening, that's a disruption, if we let it be one. Number four, the pressure to introduce new technologies for business operations. Or do you feel pressure to keep up with the market, to launch new platforms, new systems, use new technologies differently? I think most companies do. And then fifth and finally, this pressure to, to innovate in products and services. This is the result of all of your voices. This is the St. Norbert New North Survey, just published. This is happening in our backyard. Disruption is here. So let's talk about disruption differently, not as a threat, but instead as the opportunity I mentioned earlier. So if I take these five bullet points and reorganize them into a list of discussion topics for Werner, here they are. <coughs> Disruptions occurring at Werner Electric Supply Company. Without question, the war for talent is here. It impacts how we serve our customers. It impacts what we do internally to attract, develop, and retain our employees. But it also uh, manifests itself in the area of this new generation of employer. The, the millennials are coming, right? How we, how we support them, how we manage them, how we lead them, how we develop them is changing how we do business. Secondly, new competition, the Amazon effect. We'll talk about that here shortly. And then lastly, new technologies. Let's go through these, these three sections in a bit more detail. We'll start off with the war for talent. <clears throat> 
So, if Dave Gross says at breakfast this morning, I have a hard time finding people. I can't find people to do my jobs four states away. It's very, very difficult, it's, ch it's a challenge. And Kimberly Clark, the number of engineers that work for Kimberly Clark in the Valley has gone down substantially in the past 10 years. Some of that is retirements, just demographics, right? Some of that is based upon the war for talent, losing the, those employees to other, other uh, opportunities in the, in the Valley. We, they, they've lost their employees. The net result, though, is that we're finding our customers that we serve understaffed. They have a hard time getting the jobs done due to staffing levels, staffing limitations, right? So would it not be an opportunity for Werner if we can take our bullpen of specialists and engineers that we've hired and deploy them to our customers, become an extension of their team, does that not become an opportunity for us? I think it does. I think it does. This is the bullpen of people we have in Werner supporting automation. These are all domain experts, most of which four-year degree engineers, some from tech schools, that are organized by discipline. So it's hard to see in the back, I'm sorry for the small font, but services and support, motion control, PLCs, motor control centers, drives, automation. If we can extend into our customers this notion of good domain knowledge that understand the technologies, that know the applications, help them solve their business challenges, disruption becomes less of a threat and more of an opportunity. Right, Joe? More of an opportunity for us to go win. We have this for automation. We have the same thing for not automation. Once again, experts that we can deploy to extend and support our customers as an extension of their team. I argue the disruption in this case is less of a threat and more of an opportunity. Make sense? So the question that becomes, okay, Scott, that sounds great. How do you retain your people in the war for talent era? What are you doing to hold on to your people, to not lose them to the competition, lose them to Chicago or Minneapolis, they leave to go find greener pastures somewhere else? What are you doing? Well, we're all in the same boat here, right? You want to make your employment brand positive, visible, and impactful. So we're doing some things. We're doing some exciting things around that area. In the context of best place to work, we talk about the Werner way. This is our way of describing the Werner culture. We call it the Werner way. It's about teamwork, about collaboration. It's about honesty, integrity, being trustworthy, being reliable. This, these are the words we use to describe our culture internally. We call it the Werner way. We celebrate that every chance we possibly get. That becomes a grounding point for who we are, our culture as a company, okay? But on top of that, we do things to promote the employment brand. We make Warner a fun place to work. Uh, we, we're doing things with the food trucks on Friday afternoons coming in to, to serve lunch to our employees. Appreciation days at Miller Park, you know, with the, with the employees and their families, okay? Uh, some awards that we've won here recently. Celebrating employees' accomplishments. These are all low-hanging fruit. You're all doing this all, already internally in your own companies, I'm sure of it. But one thing we learned on recognition, recognize an employee's achievements professionally. But we've also learned over the past 24 months the impact of recognizing their personal achievements as well. When they get married, that wedding gift from the company to the couple. When they have a child, the future salesperson for Werner, the bib and the, the, you know, the Werner garb in, 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 in infant you know, sizes. We've learned that recognizing as much the personal achievements of the employees, their personal milestones of their, of their lives, again, marriages, births of children, et cetera, means as much or more to them, their satisfaction, their morale, their commitment to the company, as does the professional recognition. So we're doing these things, we feel good about this. These are all the, the low hanging fruit, the annies to play, the things you're already doing internally. We spend a lot of time and money on this, but here's what's a little humbling. With these millennials coming in, right? Once again, millennials, the new generation, potentially a disruptor. You know, they, they job hop too often, they want VPs in their titles in the first 24 months. All these things you've read about, you know, over the past two or three years, right? We've all read the same stories. We've learned, we've learned that this stuff is good, this stuff helps on the screen, but what matters more to the millennials is this, volunteerism. We bring in, um, on average, about 24 interns per summer to Werner. I am amazed at what these young people can accomplish in two and a half months. It's a little bit humbling in terms of their impact to our success. What they do in two and a half months is unbelievable in terms of what they accomplish professionally, technically, how they grow in, in 10 weeks time. It's amazing. At the end of the summer, we sit them all down in a big auditorium 
and we have them present back to us. Tell us about your experience. What did you do? What did you work on this summer? What did you learn? And what did you, what did you take away from your experience at Werner? Did you have fun? Here's where it gets interesting. Half the interns last summer said, my favorite day at Werner this summer wasn't the Miller Park baseball game, wasn't the T. Rattlers game, wasn't the dinner we had out at the, at the, at the holidays, you know, bar and grill. My favorite day at Werner was a day of volunteering at Riverview Gardens. And here's what they said. I want to work for a company like Werner that allows their employees time to volunteer in the community. I find that to be important to me personally. Half of them said this in their exit interviews. Half of them. So once again, we can sit and wallow in our self-pity about the millennials and job hopping and VPs and titles in two and a half years, their expectations, all these challenging things that we think we know about millennials. I'm saying, wait a minute. If that's what motivates them, if that's what makes them tick, let's go tap into this notion of volunteerism, of community involvement, and drive towards your sense of purpose and get more accomplished with them in terms of uh, them being a long-term Warner employee. It's a lesson we've learned that I think is worthy of sharing with all of you. Get your, your, your young people, your early career people involved in the community. Let them volunteer, promote it. Offer them the opportunity to go do that. I think you'll find their morale and their stickiness back to the company is much increased. Make sense? How's this for pace? Is this pace about right? Okay, okay. We've also, we've also done things like Feed the Body, Feed the Soul. We packed uh, 56 employees and volunteers and their spouses, their kids, 48,000 pounds of rice, pasta, and beans. You, you leave these things tired and, 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 and sweaty and, and exhausted physically, but you're recharged mentally. I encourage you to look at it yourselves and get involved. It makes a big difference. Okay, let's switch gears now and talk about the competition, okay? The Amazon impact. Who in the room, show of hands, feels a, a threat from a new competition, a new competitor not, not in place five, 10 years ago? Show of hands, anybody? How many of those are Amazon, or, or online? Is that fair? Many of them? It is for us, certainly. Check this out. Here is Amazon's website, uh, just a screen capture of a product that we sell. So here it is on Amazon. Um, it's, it's a simple product. We sell probably uh, 500,000 of these per year over the course of an annual sequence, right? Here's our website, same product, where you can log, download user sheets and specification manuals, installation guides. People that bought this also bought these things as well, okay? Click to chat, I'm lost, what do I wanna buy? I'm not really sure. They can click a button on our website to chat to a live person, okay? We have a website. Is our website, by the way, as strong as Amazon's, and robust? Will it ever be? No. We're not gonna win beating Amazon at their own game. If you can't win the game that's in front of you, change the game, right? We're not gonna beat Amazon with a better website. It's not going to happen. We did launch, by the way, mobile apps on your smartphones to do the same thing, check real-time inventory and pricing and all these things, dispatch parts to your job site you know, with a, you know, two hours notice. We've done these things to keep up with Amazon. We've done these things to, to not lose ground. You've gotta have a, a presence there but we're never gonna beat Amazon with a better website. It's a fact, accept it. If you can't change the, you can't, can't win by the game, change the game, right? How do we win? Amazon can't teach your customers how to use what we sell. They may sell it on their website, it may even be cheaper than us, but they cannot do what we do with services locally to teach their customers how to use it. We offered two classes, two, uh, two winter universities last year, one in Milwaukee, one in Green Bay, You'll see the attendance, 222 customers for Milwaukee, 261 for Green Bay. We teach our customers how to deploy the automation, the data comm, the networking that we sell. We teach them how to use it. We help them troubleshoot it. We show them how to, how to make it work successfully and effectively and productively, okay? I think the way to beat Amazon is not with a better website. You'll never win that battle. The way to beat Amazon is through services. What can we do locally they can't duplicate centrally? services, right? Here's another version of the same thing. This is, this is now a, a university, uh, uh, and by the way, we, we people that come to this, we charge a, a nominal fee. We charge 100 bucks per attendee. We want them to have skin of the game. 
we promise them and give them CEUs for their development. So they come, they take classes from our instructors, and they get CEUs for, towards their professional development. Okay, so they've got a reason to be there that's, that's, that's more than just the free hats, rulers, and a good lunch. Okay? But the point is, um, we're doing more and more of these because we're learning that this is how you beat Amazon. Amazon can't teach and show and help the customer deploy the technology that we sell and they sell against us. Here's one around process control that we're doing in Green Bay in May at Lambeau Field. This is, this is more focused on process control for food and beverage, cheese processing, pulp and paper, okay? But, but these are opportunities for us to win and drive stickiness with the customers that our competition online cannot easily, if ever, duplicate. If you can't win by the game, change the game, right? More and more services. Every one of these bullet points on this slide have come from uh, a customer saying, Warner, we love working with you. Uh, you're a great partner. You, you provide us great products, a good price and high quality. But if you could help us with managing our inventory or better support after hours or training for our employees, doing lighting design and layout, if you could help us with these things, it'd be, we'd be grateful. So we launched and developed these services, and over the past 20 years, this portfolio grows every day. It, it's exciting to think about where we're headed with this, but this is how you win, in my opinion, against those online competition. Change the disruptor from, my gosh, they've got a better website, they're lower price than us. Change it to, we have a good website and good quality products, but more importantly, I've got the resources to embed in your job site to make that job successful. What's that worth to you, okay? Services moving ahead, I mean, more and more, we're not just providing the device, the enclosure, the PLC, the contactor, the junction box. We're saying, let us modify that for you. If you buy an enclosure, these are those big gray boxes, you put things in electrically, right? Okay, so oftentimes those, those enclosures are modified. We'll, we'll cut the holes in the door for uh, electronic displays, or a push button station, or a, f a ventilation kit in the sides, okay? Rather than supply the customer the box and have them make the modifications, we bought the machine. This is about 12 feet uh, tall, about 14 feet wide. We mount the enclosure. We load the customer's engineering file into a computer system, a CNC machine system. We hit start and we modify the, the enclosure for that customer. When it, comes, when it comes to their job site, an OEM or a manufacturer or a contractor, it's modified per their CAD files. We buy, literally, we buy 55 truckloads of, of conduit per year. Um, in the summer months, we might have three truckloads of conduit come in per week. We sell a lot of steel pipe, okay? Rather than just sell the steel pipe, would it not make more sense for us to, if the customer's gonna have it cut on the job site and thread the end of it and bend it, let's do that for them before we ship it to them. Let's do it centrally and provide that service to them. Do you think the price of conduit matters as much in that environment as it did before? It doesn't. Take the disruption and turn it around to an opportunity. I think there's chances for us to go do that in our businesses. Okay, last section is leveraging new technologies for uh, our business and for growth. So let's focus on that now. <clears throat> we have recently kicked off fleet tracking software for our trucks. We own uh, five semi-trailers, tractor trailers, and about 45 delivery trucks that make deliveries around the state to our customers around the state. Um, do you think our drivers like having fleet tracking software on those trucks? What was that, yes? Mm. They hate it. Our drivers hate it. I can tell you, I can tell you where driver Bob was speeding, how long he was speeding for, how fast he was going over the limit. I can tell you when he rolled through a stop sign how often he does it, daily, weekly. I can show him a report of where he went and decelerated too quickly to a stop, okay? This is a great thing for risk management, but our drivers hate it. They loathe this big brother watching over them. But it's a good thing for business. However, however, the opportunity is the same software, fleet tracking software, I can now put on my smartphone on that app that I showed you and give to a customer they can track their delivery of their equipment coming to their job site. Ooh, the truck's 4.6 miles away. Let's go meet them at the front gate. Once again, the disruption becomes an opportunity. Leverage it differently for customer benefit, right? Automated order entry. We have about 60 people in Warner 
we call customer service representatives. They do the, the, the uh, telephone work. They'll answer the phone call from a customer. And their job historically has been to enter the orders for what the customer wants to buy. So quantity 10 of 1785-L80B, they'd enter these orders, okay? We have automated that process now with a special software where now our best customers, and we offer this kind of the gold service to our best customers, they can send their purchase orders. It may be an Excel spreadsheet. It may be something out of SAP or Oracle. They can mail their, their purchase orders to this website that instantly converts it to our business system within a second, with 100% accuracy. So now, when the customer calls in saying, I just hit send out an order, oh, I see it, it's in, the, it's in our system now. It's not, it's not on a spreadsheet. It's not in Oracle or on a hard copy PDF. This is in our system already. I see what you've ordered here. We didn't, order, we didn't add this software to reduce our headcount from 60 down to 40 or 35 or 30. We've kept all of our people. I want, instead of them doing this, entering the data on the phone, I noticed, Mr. Customer, that you ordered the drive and the motor. How about the cable in between? Or are you aware there's a new power supply that's got one third less footprint than the one you've ordered? Is panel space an issue for you in this particular project? I want them on the phone driving more value for the customer. It's not about headcount reduction. It's not about you know, driving reduced staffing. It's about adding more value to the customer. Back to services, right? Back to that stickiness that allows us to stay with our customers longer and better. The disruption is not, yes, manpower are tight. Yes, it's hard to find people. Yes, this offers me a hedge against not backfilling as many CSRs as I've had in the past if I chose to go do that. But I argue, wait a minute, don't reduce the headcount. Use it instead as a commercial advantage. It's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity. How about social media? Um, this is an area where I was not, I mean, I, you know, you, you try and lead by example, this is not in my wheelhouse, okay, I'll tell you right now. This is not where I'm strong, but as a company, and this data's through July, we're up to 200,000 now uh, more recently, 180,000 in July impressions per month via social media. We are pumping out tweets and texts and links, 180,000 impressions a month to our customers, okay? This is important because more and more, with demographics, the war for talents, people retiring, Casey losing two thirds of their workforce in the Valley, doing more with less. More and more, those, those replacement engineers coming to KC are shopping right here. They're shopping right here. We better have a vehicle for serving their technical needs of what they wanna buy, how they wanna buy it, right here. Make sense? So 180,000 impressions a month in July. This is up over 200,000 now at the end of the year, okay? What are we pumping out? We're pumping out these tweets, these texts, and these two-minute videos. Our number one click-through, the number one point where people watch the entire message, and by the way, with these social media sites, you can track what they actually open up and read, or what they watch on video. We can tell you which videos are popular, which ones are not. Which ones op open up and close in 10 seconds? Redo it. Throw it out the window, redo it, right? The number one click-through are these two-minute videos. And we open every video the same way. My name is Ralph, I work at Warner. I am the motion control specialist. I'm gonna show you today how to, how to troubleshoot this platform of motion control drive. Two minutes long, any questions about the motion platform you're using, call me, here's my email, here's my address, call me. Service, stickiness, value to the customers, extend their, to their teams. It's about driving better stickiness and therefore growth in market share with our customers, right? Use the technology to our advantage. <clears throat> We're also doing these, these posts with channels. So a given salesperson, this is Chris Helling, he works out of our Appleton office. Pat still works in Madison office. We tailor the messaging to his territory, his accounts. In this case, Chris is calling on a contractor. We're showing them how we're loading reels of, of cable on the back of a flatbed truck for easier pull off at a job site. This actually be done at Secura. This, this job was going to Secura for their new headquarters building, okay? But we tailor the message to Chris's audience, his class of customers. Pat Stilp and Madison, working in a cheese processing fa opportunity. So there it is. We tailor that message to really hit the sweet spot of the customers that Pat Stilp calls upon. Very focused, very impactful. Okay, technology. I'd like to share with you a 90 seconds worth of a video about deploying technology to give you a better feel of what we're doing to deploy technology to do, uh, avoid the disruption, but create the opportunity. 
At Werner Electric Supply, we're always ready to accommodate your electrical equipment and supplies needs. We offer a wide variety of critical electrical components, equipment, and parts including industrial automation, safety products, pneumatics, motors, lighting, wire, cable, enclosures, data comm, and security. How do we offer over 25,000 stock keeping units and accommodate your supply requirements efficiently? By reinventing the way your order is processed. We designed and implemented a state-of-the-art, high-performance automated warehouse that can fill thousands of orders each day. In addition, it is scalable and can accommodate surges in demand as well as future growth. Once you place an order with Warner Electric, it will be picked, packed, and shipped with speed and accuracy using modern technology and methods. Here's how we do it. Inventory is received from our suppliers, scanned, and placed into totes. The put-away process is optimized by a smart conveyor network that allows automatic transport to strategic locations in the warehouse. The item velocity, size, and weight determine the appropriate location for storage. Inbound inventory is scanned during the restocking process to direct put-away and support accuracy. When your order is received, it's downloaded to the warehouse execution system, which controls and directs the processes to pick, pack, and ship each item. A barcode label is printed for your order and applied to a shipping carton. Next, the shipping carton is entered onto the conveyor network. Our staff does not need to roam the warehouse looking for items in your order. Instead, the order carton is automatically conveyed to zones in the warehouse where order fulfillment specialists are positioned. Scan validation at multiple points directs each order carton to the appropriate zone, ensures accuracy, and allows real-time tracking. Okay, when so I'll stop there just arrives. for now, but um, you, you heard about speed, about accuracy, right? But here's the deal. We can stay open three hours longer per day, taking orders tonight until 7.30 tonight, you know, tonight for delivery by tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock in the morning. That was at 4.30 back in our Nina facility two and a half years ago. So the customers like the fact we can stay open later for, for business and, and do a better job supporting them. But what this does not mention, deploying technology to address the disruptor of the war for talent. We can run 30% more volume, 30% more volume through that warehouse with no change to headcount, no change to staffing. It's about productivity. Deploying automation, in this case, to address the disruptor of talent availability, the war for talent, et cetera, right? Being operationally efficient and productive is a game changer for us. This is, this is, this is truly, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm proud, so this is, this is truly uh, world class. This, this is good performance here. So I hope that you've seen some examples of, of how we have taken what would be threats and issues to our longevity, our profitability, our growth, and turned them around to say, wait a minute, let's embrace the disruption, not as a threat, but how do we turn it around into an opportunity for us to go do more growth, more market share, better customer support, expansion, all those positive things instead. Turn it around. Don't let disruptions eat your lunch. Turn it around and eat that lunch, right? Win. Is it working? Time will tell. We're, on a, we're off to a good start. We've got um, some great performance and, and whatnot, but time will tell. But I think that us doing this within Warner is allowing us to stay ahead of the curve and, you know, really, like I said, change the rules of the game to our advantage, whether that be market share, growth, employer retention, et cetera, et cetera. That's my update. Are there, uh, are there any questions I can answer for you? Sure. Great, great presentation. Um, I have a question about the war for talent. Where are you focusing your talent pipeline? Are you looking at the, the colleges? Uh, are, you, are you going mid-level career? Where, do you, where are you finding your people right now? So, uh, great question. Where do we find our people? We recruit today at Michigan Tech, at Madison, at Platteville, at Oshkosh, at St. Norbert. I mean, we, we go all over Oshkosh. I mean, we go all over. Um, we recruit. Uh, we've got a, the benefits of a great tech school system in our area. You know, here at Appleton, up in Green Bay, some phenomenal tech schools that we recruit at as well. What I would say to you for recruitment, a um, couple things. Number one, don't ever underestimate the importance of internships. You expose your company to a, to a, a junior in college or, or a second year tech school student, you're selling your company to them. We find our highest retention rates are those that come to us through the intern program, number one. So that's, that's impactful. Number two, we also embrace what the Chamber is doing, the Fox Cities Chamber, with the talent upload. That's being morphed away from talent upload into what we call the Traverse City model, 
which is where, um, and we're doing this actually uh, as a chamber in about two weeks at Michigan Tech. There's about a half dozen executives going up to Michigan Tech to go sell the students in Houghton on the Fox Valley. Quality of life, quality of you know, schools, uh, things to do you know, outside of work, you know, the hunting, the fishing, the packers, all the great things that our community has to offer. We're gonna go sell these students on you know, personally. We'll also talk about businesses and opportunity professionally, but we're gonna go take the message to them versus them come to see us instead. Uh, we're also working um, with New North and the Chamber on some diversity ac activities to make our community a little less homogenous and tap into the opportunity that is, that is expanding every quarter and every year for more and more diverse candidates to come into the workforce. I don't know about you guys, but at Warner, I, I, I need more people. And that's a great, a, a great source of, uh, of staffing down the road, so we're going to tap into that as well. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Sure. As you invest in uh, social media and new aspects of growth for your company and, and acquiring new customers, what are you sunsetting? What's going off the plate? That's a good question. I'll be very honest, we all have strengths and weaknesses. Letting things go is not one of my personal strengths. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, um, what are we sunsetting? Um, well, I, I, I'll revert back to my presentation. You know, we're doing less of the order entry, having more time for value add activities. We are trying to automate, whether it be the warehouse that I showed you the video of, but automating the, the, the uh, accounts receivable function within accounting, um, automating um, our, our HR information systems. We're trying to do more and more technology to make us more efficient. It's not to reduce headcount, but instead to redeploy resources to where they matter the most, in this case, social media. So we're trying to become more efficient and more productive. That's a, that's a, that's a hard thing to change and, and move. And we turn pretty slow sometimes that way. But I think we're on the right path to automating more systems not to reduce headcount, like I said, but instead to create the opportunity for social media, for productivity enhancements, for customer services, the things that matter moving forward in this disruptive environment. Did that answer your question? Yeah, okay, not really, okay. <laughs> Thanks for letting me off the hook. Other questions? How old is the warehouse that you showed us? We opened, uh, we opened the warehouse uh, April 6th of 2016. We shipped on Friday, April 3rd, out of Nina. We shipped Monday, April uh, 6th, out of Appleton. It was a weekend cutover. Two and a half years of planning to get that pulled together. It was not, it was not air free. We had some challenges, but all things told, it was, pretty, it was pretty well done. Yeah, we're proud of that. We're proud of that. Yeah. Sure. So are, you, are you always a positive disruptor, or did something happen over the years that put Warner in this position? I think, I think that as a culture, um, taking pride in who we are, how we operate, our focus on the customer. Uh, I think that that, that, that per pervasive element of our culture allows us to be well positioned to say, wait a minute, we're not gonna let this impact us negatively. We're not gonna, not gonna be a victim here. Let's turn this around into a net positive. How do we take the environmental input that we're facing, the disruption, and turn it into a net positive for ourselves and for our customers? I think some of that's systemic. It's plenty of cultural. Yeah, sure. Hey, Scott, you shared a number of examples of like innovative things you've done in the business. And yeah, I guess it's a two-fold question. One, how do you weigh whether or not to make investments you know, in, in new innovative <coughs> efforts? And like, what do you think is your success rate? You know, we, you're sharing us. That's a tough question, Jim. Thank you for asking that. Yes, our success rate. Uh, I, I would say, number one, we are advantaged immensely by the culture that Lynn McDonald established for Werner, which was um, we're an S-corp, we pay our taxes you know, out, of the, out of the income of the company. Whatever's left over gets reinvested back in the company for growth. So this notion of investing in growth is not new. It's not something we just did, started doing six years ago. It's been a place for a long time. Um, I think that's an advantage for us in the market being privately held and, and Lynn's approach to reinvesting in growth in, in the future of the business. What's our hit rate, our win rate? Um, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not trying to be evasive. I don't know the answer to, honestly. Um, I will tell you this. I will tell you this. One of, our, one of our limitations in the Warner way, the culture, is this fear of failure. We're trying hard to say, wait a minute, we can't be afraid to take risks and have them not go our way. Now, we want to be calculated and smart about it. We're not going to be stupid, you know, taking, you know, you know, dumb risks, but let's not be afraid to go try and even try and fail, learn from it, and do it again better the next time. 
So case in point, we had a, a good example where we celebrated, frankly, failure internally. We, uh, we, we launched uh, two branches in North Dakota about three years ago. We were doubling the business year upon year each of the past two and a half years. The business was going great. But we realized that our investments in the income we were earning was a fraction of what it would have been in Wisconsin with the same investment. The ROI was one-fifth the Wisconsin ROI. Why are we doing this? So we literally exited North Dakota. Very painful discussion, very painful uh, process. But frankly, I use it to celebrate the fact that we tried this. It didn't work out the way we wanted it to. There's nothing wrong with that. We're gonna keep trying those things. You know, so this overcoming this fear of failure is a big part of our, our, our next couple of years. Thanks, Jim. Other questions? Yeah. Those um, value-added costs, if you will, that are associated with your labor pool, you had mentioned about doing extra things, which, by the way, I totally concur with that. It's in today's environment. You have it's to. not the salary, it's all these other things. Yeah. What kind of dollars do you attribute to additional overhead costs to that? Um, it has to go somewhere. Uh, when you're doing days off and volunteering, that's all great work. <laughs> but there is a cost associated with those types of things. How do I say this politely and, and respectfully? When you've done nothing for 20 years, doing something feels like a lot of money, okay? Um, we had a record um, for many, many years of, of not focusing on this whatsoever. And um, we are spending more money annually in employee development and training, uh, in employee recognition. We launched an online app called Kudos for online recognition. We are now touching 82% of our people uh, on a real-time basis with appreciation and recognition on a daily basis. 80% of our population of 450 employees. Um, so we're spending money here. I think the issue is not uh, as a percent of sales what we're spending, it's a fact that for a long, long time we did none of that. It wasn't a focus, it wasn't a priority. Once again, it didn't have to be. People came to a company for life, they were committed. Um, this is where I'm gonna be. Frankly, my kids come work at Warner, my, my nephews, my nieces, my brothers. I mean, it was a family affair, you know, literally. And, and um, that's a good thing, but, but in this day and age, if we don't recognize, appreciate, you know, um, we lose them. So the, the, the investments that we're making are, are, are money's well spent on driving that retention and that, that culture of recognition and appreciation that we'd never done before. I tell you, we, when I say we did nothing, we did nothing for a long time. <laughs> I think I'm getting my cue here for time's up, right? So um, we'll make the slides available. Uh, if it, we'll, we'll pass the slides out after the presentation, so you'll get the slides. Um, I will include on the slide my, my email, my phone number, call me with questions. We can discuss things further. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thanks for having me in. I really appreciate the opportunity to our sponsors for sponsoring this, to St. Norbert's for, for facilitating this. Thanks for the opportunity. It's great to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Really nice Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and uh, kudos to you for your work, and uh, thank you for uh, showing us the upside in disruption. So congratulations. Thank you for being here. Um, I would like to uh, let you know if you'd like a copy, not only of the presentation, but of this entire event, um, we can make that available to you. Just see Amy Sorensen or Lisa Gray, I believe they're right here, um, for a copy. And we'd like to invite you to please join us at our next CEO Breakfast Series on March 5th at St. Norbert College. Christopher Howell of Tweet Garrett will be the presenter. I also want to take this opportunity to follow up on something Scott mentioned, uh, to attend an event on January 30th at St. Norbert College co-sponsored by the New North and St. Norbert College. The survey uh, and the research that was done, uh, Dr. Jamie Lynch will present the findings on this business intelligence survey followed by discussion. More information on that can be found in your uh, folders. We really encourage you to come and see what new insights we've been able to generate in this partnership with New North and St. Norbert College through our Schneider School of Business <coughs> and Economics. It's a, gonna be a very intriguing, interesting, valuable session. I invite you to join us. And um, it is my great privilege to have you here today. I want you to have a delightful day and travel safely. Thank you for being with us.